for the audience out there, uh, Zephyr Teachout is a professor at Fordham Law. And besides that, she is one of the greatest troublemakers in this country. Well, uh, thank she, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, she's a, a political activist and author. And uh, let's see, she's had three, three runs at elective office. The first, most famous perhaps is in 2014, she ran in the primary against Cuomo and wound up with Tim Wu as, as vice governor and wound up with what, 34% of the vote with almost no spending, which tells you how unhappy people are with Cuomo. And then she ran in 2016 in the 19th district uh, won the primary, but lost to Faso, who was now fortunately departed. But uh, in 2018, she ran for New York State Attorney General, and I had the pleasure of hosting a fundraiser for that. Uh, and again, it was a three-way race, and I think she came in second to, to Tish James. And at some point, I want to ask you how you think Tish James is doing. I mean, we've known Tish has been you know, around on this neighborhood for a long time. So we've been watching her closely. So, and you've been very active in campaign finance reform and Occupy Wall Street and Let America Vote, which is a, a, one of the many get out the vote organizations. And it's hard to tell which ones are, are better and worse, or I get deluged by them. So maybe you can tell us a bit about that. And uh, you wrote a book in 2014 called The Corruption of America, I guess mostly about antitrust and corruption. I, I, don't, I have not read it. And now your newest and latest is Break Em Up, which I highly recommend. I have read and uh, written a small review and it's gotten a lot of very good reviews. And it's kind not, of a, not, as, not as great as yours, Polly. So thank you for that. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, I'm I'm glad to hear that. Well, I I started out with my own run in with the, with the latest little monopolist. They're all out there, you know. At every corner, there's there's these little, uh, you know, corporate financed private corporations trying to grab another little piece of monopoly here, a little one there, and the run in I had was was with. Uh, something called carbonite, which is in the process of trying to uh, monopolize cloud backups. So anyway, you can, you can read my story about that. But uh, with that introduction, I think maybe Zephyr, if you want to tell us something about why you wrote this book, what you're hoping to accomplish with it, uh, and, and also about the new uh, the set of recommendations from Cicilline's committee. Uh, yeah. Cicilline, is that how you pronounce it? Cicilline. Cicilline. Cicilline, okay. I never know whether it should be legit Italian or what, uh, which has just come out with this massive, supposedly 400 page report, which I haven't had a chance to look at. So, uh, you know, take it away. And then we have some people online here who may, who are sending in questions for you, and I may have some more. So, Let's hear more about your book and, and whatever you recommend that we do next. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for hosting. And in fact, uh, Polly and I met um, because of Polly's uh, great work, uh, her, both her public writing and um, teaching uh, in this area. And um, really introduced me to uh, characters who are not featured strongly in this book. This is uh, much more a contemporary polemic, um, but uh, the, the Henry George and other uh, uh, anti-monopolists in American history. So what I'd like to do is just give a brief introduction. I, I see in the attendees uh, some dear friends and deep intellects, and I can say this, the same for my hosts, and so give a brief introduction for, for what I am trying to accomplish, a few key ideas, um, and then talk about uh, what is happening right now 
in American antitrust and anti-monopoly because we're actually at this really very exciting um, critical moment. Um, and uh, uh, briefly, and then and then opened up for something more of a free ranging conversation. I think there'll be that, that'll be more productive. Um, where we can talk about the interaction of the court, for instance, um, with uh, anti-monopoly, which is something very much on my mind uh, these days. Um, not to show my cards too much, but I am terrified of a 6-3 of a uh, court with Barrett on it. Um, and it has real implications for these kinds of uh, cases, although there's uh, it's different than, than in some other areas of law. So we can talk about the court and then also talk about um, the Biden administration and, and the real opportunity for a Biden-Harris administration to show real leadership in this area, which I have some um, significant hope about. Uh, I, I don't think it's a sure thing, uh, but I think there's a real opportunity. So um, the, the, the crude form, the, the short form is that I, I wrote this um, book because um, as a serious activist progressive, I see the ways in which corporate monopolization is um, driving extraordinary levels of inequality, for one. There's recent research that shows that concentration is uh, corporate concentration and our uh, allowance of massive mergers is responsible for as much as uh, 14 to $15,000 per year per worker um, transferred from workers to investors. So it's a massive driver of inequality. When you look at the wealthiest people in the country, you will note that all of them made their money through um, monopolization. And if we are going to address the massive inequality in our country, we have to address the root cause, the root causes, and they're multiple, but monopoly is a key root cause. And while I support um, incredibly uh, progressive taxation, taxation is not enough. We also have to address the root causes. Don't, don't just redistribute after we've already allowed the theft from, uh, from workers and small businesses. Um, but then I also am concerned about the ways in which monopolization um, and the massive merger wave of the last 40 years, it's basically post Reagan to now, has really been a major driver of racial inequality and has wiped out significant sectors of power in the black community as well as in all communities of color. And think about, as I ask people to do in the, the book, the civil rights movement today, we don't have the funeral homes, small independent pharmacies, um, uh, uh, black owned insurance companies, black owned newspapers that were actually incredibly important along with black owned car services in being a source of political and economic power to allow the unbelievably difficult and brave protests of that era. And that's really dangerous. Instead, we've had the effect of bleaching out that power through this merger wave. Uh, the, the funeral homes have been merged into basically just two funeral homes. And I can tell you, SCI, one of the big players here, is not about to be supporting civil rights activism. Um, and then there's a, a series of ways in which corporate monopolization is driving um, the uh, really a takeover of our democracy from the inside. I think of it like Scylla and Charybdis. We have Trump here and corporate monopolization here, and they're both attacks, frontal attacks on self-government. Um, the ways in which you probably intuitively understand is the ways in which um, big companies are uh, buying up the political process. And although I do have a chapter on that, I focus less on that here. Um, instead, um, look at the ways in which Amazon has become a private form of government for those who interact with it. And there's over 2 million um, uh, small businesses that sell through Amazon. Um, that Amazon is the regulator, the intellectual property regime, um, the, the court, the king of... Um, uh, up. I just saw a change in the screen. I hope that's okay for everybody. I'm now viewing a uh, Polly's uh, screen. Is that d desired, Polly? Uh, I don't know if I screwed something up. I was <laughs> trying to see if I could see the other, the rest of the guests. Well, we and now get to 
you, you screen shared, so we're now seeing your screen. Well, that isn't what I meant to do at all. I apologize. No problem. Well, as long as we're on Zoom, I'll use it as a brief introduction to how monopolies work. Google leverages its monopolies in one area to gain monopolies in another. Right now, it is on a master attack on Zoom. And you will find in your uh, Gmail invitations that Google will prioritize the Google Meets link over the Zoom link as it tries to use its leverage in one area to uh, gain leverage in another. Well, I'm, I'll keep talking while you work on the. There's a place where you can say stop screen sharing at the top of the screen. Do you see that, Polly? God. Stop share. Oh, that's what I, I hit the wrong button. I apologize. I wanted to see no the other participants, but. But that was the wrong button, obviously. Sorry. Um, so uh, just again, just a few a few more moments on this, the ways in which um, monopolization is really a, a rival form of government. And this is something people understood up until the 1980s. You see this in court opinions. You see this um, in political discussion. Phil Hart, um, who's one of my real heroes as a lawmaker, uh, had two passions. Um, civil rights and anti-monopoly and went to his deathbed working on antitrust laws because he saw big corporations as posing a fundamental threat to um, democracy. Uh, you know who else had this, those same two passions as Ronald Reagan and, and Mies and Baxter who all came in trying to destroy both of those, sort of right. destroy the successes of the civil rights movement and destroy um, antitrust law. And they're very explicit about it. If you look at the, um, the stories, those of you who remember the time or have read about the time will know who I'm talking about with Mies and Baxter, but at least you know who Reagan is. Um, the stories about Mies and Baxter, his California wrecking crew, are stories about how they came in to transform antitrust. It was very explicit, very direct. And so uh, before we get into all the other pathologies of concentrated power, I want to say two things. One is um, uh, this is a result of policy. It's a policy choice we made 40 years ago. It is not, often people say markets naturally um, do X or Y, naturally monopolize. Yeah, well, uh, people are going to try to amass power. But there's nothing natural. It's our choice as a society. One of our most essential jobs is to limit um, private power from governing us. That's what that's what uh, our lawmakers are supposed to protect us from private um, as well as public tyrants. Um, and up until the 1980s, we really understood this. Reagan transformed the judiciary and brought in enforcers who didn't believe in enforcing the law and changed the philosophy of antitrust. Um, that's the bad news. Um, the good news is that we can re-choose all of those things, um, that this is uh, something that, uh, I'm getting a feedback echo somewhere, but uh, this is something that aggressive um, leadership from the president can make an enormous difference on. Aggressive leadership from the Congress can make an enormous difference on. Um, um, and that gets me to, I'm still getting that feedback. But, um, they get, gets me the last two things I wanted to say before uh, we open it up for uh, a discussion. It doesn't just have to be questions, but I'd love to have a, a real discussion. Um, the, 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 the moment we are in um, is sort of early, late, new anti-monopoly. <laughs> that um, there is a massive shift. When Tim Wu and I ran for governor in 2014, we ran as trust busters. We actually held events, mostly focused on, on Cuomo shutting down the Moreland Commission. But we uh, also held events at um, cable companies, ripping up people's cable bills. And what we found is that there's incredible hunger. People actually really get it, that there's a, a problem of corporate power. We've since done polling. When I say we, I mean, the, uh, the uh, I, I did some polling uh, this spring. Um, uh, other groups have done polling that show overwhelming anger at corporate monopolies, desire for a president who will act to break up big tech, big ag, and concentrations of power more generally, desire for congressional action in this area. It's actually bar bipartisan. 
And what's remarkable about this is it's not something that many politicians have been talking about. And so people are demanding it, even though the, pub, the media waves are not telling people that this is a big issue. So on the ground, there's enormous excitement about, or maybe I shouldn't put excitement, anger and frustration and disempowerment and despair. Actually, I'm really not giving a summary of the book. I'm just highlighting some themes. It's more narrative than what I'm describing. And I end up um, writing a fair amount about um, suicide and depression because one of the things that we have in our, our modern monopolized economy is a deep feeling of disempowerment, rational paranoia, rational fear that you're subject to somebody else's experiment. And um, I was really struck by the similar language you hear from uh, Uber drivers and chicken farmers who are subject to really different concentrated power regimes, Tyson and Uber, but have a similar um, experience of debilitating anger, depression, and fear because they can lose their job in a day, uh, have no real power within a system, are wholly dependent on centralized um, uh, centralized corporations that have no transparency in, in their decision making. Um, so uh, the exciting thing that has just happened is truly transformational. David Sicily um, ran one of the best congressional investigations that I have seen in my lifetime uh, uh, with a the antitrust subcommittee that was started by Keith Ellison before he left to become attorney general um, and others has become a incredibly powerful subcommittee. They did a year of investigation, got over uh, a million documents from big tech. They were focusing on big tech and they'll be focusing on other areas of the economy going forward. Um, held a hearing in which they actually forced new revelations from all of the tech CEOs, which is something you never see. They were so well prepared. They only have a staff of five and they were so well prepared that they actually knew enough to know what questions to ask that we learned things at that hearing and we learned about techniques of abuse. Um, uh, just to give one example, um, something that Amazon sellers have believed for a long time, um, but Bezos submitted to at the hearing is that the algorithm that decides who gets preferred in your search results takes into account whether the seller is also using other Amazon services. In other words, hey, if you use my service here, you're going to get favored in my search result, um, which is an incredible money machine for Amazon and incredible money for the um, uh, Amazon seller. So it's a revelatory um, investigation. And then the committee has just come out with a very significant report with bipartisan support for the findings of a serious problem, which you never, you don't see very much bipartisanship here at all. And then a um, democratic across the board agreement on a series of very significant legislative changes um, uh, for uh, Congress. And understand that the Cicilline subcommittee includes progressive heroes like Pramila Jayapal and Jamie Raskin, who I dearly love and admire and you uh, may often hear about, but also um, amazing lawmakers who are from tough swing districts you may not usually think about as sort of being the progressive champions. People like um, uh, Congressman Scanlon, who was fantastic on this committee, uh, Congresswoman McBath, who you know as an incredible leader on uh, gun safety. These are um, these uh, amazing uh, cross-examining of, of uh, Cook. Um, and so you saw a committee deeply engaged coming out with not trivial, but very significant proposals, including structural separation, which is a way to talk about break, breaking up. And, you know, you can be basically what Elizabeth Warren was talking about a year and a half ago. Um, but this is a uh, ideologically diverse uh, committee coming out and saying we cannot allow um, companies to both be the platform and sell on the platform. It hurts small businesses too much. It's it's leading to inequality. It's a real problem. Got to stop doing that. Um, as well as a series of other reforms, including overturning um, over ten bad Supreme Court decisions. Scalia has really been a leader in this area, but there are a lot of bad decisions that have made it harder and harder 
uh, to enforce antitrust law. So it's a it's an exciting moment because you have um, this committee coming out with these reports, and if Biden takes these up, this can really be transformative. Mm -hmm. um, and we are we are facing we are in a uh, a really um, horrific economic time for small businesses and for workers. And what we saw in that committee, and what I believe very deeply, is that the way to finally take on this concentrated power. Sorry, my, I have a <laughs> laptop um, shaking in a prophetic way because it's sitting on a small box of toys. This is the uh, this is what happens with a with a with a toddler and a and a book talk at the same time. I, my lectern is a rocky box of toys, <laughs> but take it as a metaphor for the, the country uh, in an earthquake moment. Um, and that the alliance between small businesses and workers both understanding that there's a shared threat um, as law, along with the government groups and reform groups understand that it's a democratic threat, not just an economic threat. Along with the incredible leadership of Acre and Athena and Color of Change, who are showing that this is a um, threat that is already leading to greater racial divisiveness. That if we can bring these four different sources of power together, we can actually take on these um, modern tyrants and do something extraordinary um, and really lead to an economic revitalization that we desperately desperately need. Where I am in East Harlem, you see stores closing um, and uh, we're facing a bankruptcy wave um, at the same time as the, the big tech companies and big companies more generally are, um, are doing pretty well. So uh, long answer to your question. And, and, and Paul, the one last thing I want to say is about why I wrote it is um, there are many different, there's a growing uh, collection of anti-monopoly books out there and I'm proud to be part of that, and I recommend reading all of them. I wrote it in part because I wanted to shake the shoulders of my progressive friends. Um, because as a progressive activist, I think we need to do a lot more work. I know we know that we're anti-corporate, sort of that's part of the lingo, but to do a lot more strategic work saying, well, what does that mean? Um, you know, how do you in real, in real terms have a moral economy? <laughs> And so instead of protesting Pfizer after the fact or Facebook after the fact, after they're doing something new and terrible, which they are gonna continue to do, we go at the root of power and say, you actually aren't allowed to um, be so big and powerful that when you act, it destroys so many people's lives. So they understand this, they're hiring antitrust lawyers. So we've gotta be focusing on root power issues the way that we do in, in the democracy fights that I come from and not just on symptoms. Um, so with that longer than I thought uh, introduction, um, I'd love to have a, have a bit of a conversation. Mute. Are there, uh, whoa, how do I unmute, oh Lord. Oh, there's a chat box and a Q and A box. Which one do I do? I'll You're unmuted, Polly. Um, thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to read the Q and A, or do you want to read them? Why don't you Why don't you read them? Because I still haven't found them. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. This is This um, is Dan Sullivan, uh, president of the Council of Georgia's Organizations, and uh, sitting beside Polly is Tom, her husband. I figure we should introduce him since he's in the picture. Um, I have, uh, let's see, um, back in the seventh, this is Deborah Cooper back in the seventies, the deregulation movement began or I actually recommenced, I guess. And the democratic party adopted many of these ideas, which seemingly allowed more companies to begin. But the real point of unre unregulated competition is to kill the competition. Unregulated competition is designed to eliminate most of the competitors. Um, well, Deborah is exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> and she has two other points. It, it's, it's really important because it's important to understand the corporate authoritarian goal here. Um, the language is decentralization. The effect is planned economies, but it's planned by a handful of big corporate oligarchs. <laughs> Um, and just by way of comparison, I mean, Deborah knows this, but, uh, or I assume you know this, but 
um, there were a lot more startups in 1976 in the US than there are now. It's harder to start a company now. We have a much less decentralized economy. There are more startups in Europe, which we used to sort of look at as a place where innovation couldn't happen. It is, we have totally choked economies. And, and the stories when you talk to small business owners who also have a sort of psychological tendency to blame themselves. And I think it's important to sort of highlight the ways in which to be an entrepreneur, you also, you have to be ready to go up against incredible odds that they are in unbelievable situations of being sort of privately taxed out of business. And it is so much worse right now because of the pandemic. We are looking at 40 to 50% of black businesses may go under during this pandemic. It is a total disaster, far more likely to be small um, uh, and medium sized businesses. Um, so Deborah had two, had a really important question also the top question, which is, um, I actually mentioned her second one, which was, sorry, I haven't read the report. So maybe it's um, covered. You, you actually don't have to read the report. It's okay. It's a what, four, <laughs> 470 page report. <laughs> that was not assigned homework, Deborah. You're, you're doing your assigned homework fighting against uh, <laughs> Mayor Barrett nomination. Um, uh, so the, the question is about existing antitrust laws. It's a really, really important question. The um, Enforcement has been a disaster for uh, several decades now. After Reagan left, uh, when Reagan came in, he brought in antitrust guidelines. His chief enforcers um, put out antitrust guidelines that basically turned upside down the guidelines of the previous years. So instead of, as a default, we're going to challenge mergers when a company with 5% uh, uh, in a concentrated market, acquires another company with 5% in that same market. The defaults were totally changed. Instead, Reagan said, basically, the, the simple form is mergers are going through unless you can show a really big impact on um, consumer prices. So it moved, changed antitrust law from a fundamentally prophylactic law, like we're gonna protect against concentrations of power to deeply laissez-faire. And that's not on the enforcer side. And that's something the FTC can change tomorrow. The FTC can promulgate new regulations tomorrow. Um, and, and then when it comes to enforcement, enforcement itself um, of say uh, various aspects of antitrust law beyond the promulgation of regulation, the FTC has been an embarrassment and the report is withering in its critique of um, enforcers. The information that it uncovered on Facebook, Instagram should have been uncovered by the FTC. They had all the tools, they had all the power to do it. And um, so it's a, it's an active debate within the anti-monopoly community about how much we should be pushing for legislation in all these areas and how much we should be uh, pushing for greater enforcement. Um, that said, there is a pretty broad consensus that some areas we can't just do through enforcement in part because of 40 years of accreted power already. So it's like if you start in 1980 and had enforced from 1980 onward, it's very different than facing what we face now and big tech changes things and the particular um, dynamics of big tech. So um, I believe that number one, we need to change, we need to overturn those uh, 12 bad decisions and the we can talk a little bit about them, but I'll just give you one example, one that really I think moved uh, Congresswoman Scanlon and others is um, predatory pricing. It's very difficult to show when companies subsidize another, cross subsidize within their own company, mm -hmm. another part of their own industry to take over um, an area in that industry and push out competitors and then um, uh, uh, decrease their service, uh, 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 degrade their service, having pushed out competitors. According to Robert Bork, Chicago School Reagan thinking, you aren't going to ever see predatory pricing. Competitors just won't try to push out uh, their competition because they know they'll just come back. It's always easy for people to come back. In the real world, predatory pricing happens all the time. Amazon has made a um, 
a lot of money off of it <laughs> and uh, making it a lot uh, making it impossible to prove predatory pricing has been a major problem. Well, that's something where we actually we, we have to go in and change um, change the bad Supreme Court decisions. And and uh, Deborah, one thing that was is so powerful about the report, and all of you, but one thing that's so powerful about the report is that although it says the agencies have to do more, it really claims for itself as against Scalia and the court the authority and responsibility to deal with um, uh, pathologies within our economy. Because for a long time, there's sort of a weird a sense that antitrust is not the job of Congress, that it is the job of courts, and courts say it's the job of, econ of professional economists. So that unlike, say, in like labor law or tax law, you don't feel like you have to be an expert to say, Congress needs to have a point of view on this. Congress needs to act. We need to change our tax code. We need to pay workers $25 an hour. You don't, and yet in antitrust, there's a sense like, well, I don't know, doesn't the court decide that? Isn't that something for eggheads? It's not, it's not our political sphere. And it's a very beautiful document about reclaiming congressional power. And it also, is itself a reclamation of congressional power by doing the investigation it did. And I know people are down on Congress, but like, that's what we need. We need to show Congress doing its job. And I, I found it actually very moving in that way. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, in terms of regulation, one of the things I hear is that the, the regulated often capture the regulators so that, so that they, the regulators or the regulated aren't really against regulation as long as they can dominate the regulations. And uh, so in, in a, so there is an argument or at least a shadow of an argument behind that Reagan notion that, that open competition would, would be, unregulated competition would be better. The Georgist, the Georgist response to that is there's no such thing as a free market in privilege. So the Georgists always said, what is the underlying privilege that's giving the big corporation, um, which is often less efficient, uh, power over the smaller competitors that are often more efficient? And I don't know if you've delved into those questions a lot. So which, uh, I mean, I have a lot of different thoughts about the <laughs> Maybe let, let me pick up on that one a little bit because uh, you you said something about, oh, well, you know, uh, tax reform is after the fact, uh, you know, and, and I say they go together because if you collect the economic rents, whether through income taxes or license fees, I mean, uh, you could knock out a lot of the pharmaceutical monopolization if you just charged a license fee on patents, but it's a deterrent as well. It, it, you know, yes, it connect, collects the monopoly rents, but it's also, it is also a deterrent. It takes the, and especially as Dan said, these big corporations are very inefficient. And yeah. so they are hit much harder by the same rates of taxes that you would impose on smaller businesses. So, you know, the the two go together. I mean, Joe Stiglitz has been saying this for years, antitrust and tax reform. Uh, but just to be clear, I did not, I, don't want, <laughs> I, I think this is the first time I've been understood to be somebody who does not support incredibly aggressive tax reform. <laughs> what I meant about sequencing was something much more uh, uh, basic about the sequencing of the robber first stands in the narrowest path, the highway robber stands in the narrowest path on the road and says, Polly, I need you to give me 30% of everything you've got. <laughs> and so you agree to do that. And then the government comes and taxes the robber. <laughs> so right, I would right. say two oh, things. Right, right. As, as a matter of sequencing, Apple should not be allowed to stand in the narrowest path and, and tax 30%. And then, we should be uh, taxing the illegitimate earnings. Uh, that, that's what I meant by sequencing. I did oh, not mean to. After all, but you know, Apple would have less incentive to do that if 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 that money would be taken back in taxes. Yeah. So this is so they, they, know, they, they, by they, their they incentives. Yeah. yeah, and this actually goes to another question in the chat. I think 
which is something that I take on directly in the book um, that I uh, am often, have often been confronted with the question of people saying, I don't want to um, say, break up something in healthcare, for instance, um, uh, medical devices, I want Medicare for all. And um, the answer I think is very clearly that we need Medicare for all and we need to um, uh, break up the concentration in the medical device industry. And so they're not actually opposed to each other. They are actually supportive of each other in a very fundamental way in a dynamic that's similar to what Paul is talking about, where um, when you have concentrated suppliers in medicine, whether that be in pharma or uh, medical devices or hospitals, whose mergers we in New York have seen the you know, terrible effects of. Faster in New York. Yeah. It's total disaster. Um, uh, and that is, um, that has led to hugely raised prices. But when we, when we nationalize, when we have Medicare for all, if you're negotiating with just a few big companies, you have a lot less uh, leverage than if you're, lever you're negotiating with a decentralized market. And that's true even if you want to go farther than Medicare for all and have something like the VA model that basically what is not nationalized in the healthcare industry should be decentralized. So it's just, and those relate to each other. The, the example that I sometimes use is um, from the Department of Defense. So nobody doubts the nationalization of the Department of Defense, right? Like that's pretty nationalized. Um, but you have massive concentration in the um, a supplier uh, in the in the chief contractors. We've gone from sixty five to five in the last. And encouraged by by government. Yes, too. absolutely. So it's actually procurement policy matters too, not just antitrust yeah. policy. Anti monopoly is a lot of things. It's not just antitrust. Um, um, but that concentration means the suppliers can like tell the DOD what they need. <laughs> so, you know, so when we have, you, I mean, to me, the model is Markey and AOC's Green Deal, which is national policy, a beautiful national policy. But when you look at the Green New Deal, it's about decentralized implementation, not about going over and asking Elon Musk if he can just give us a Green New Deal. It's like, no, we want to actually have the rural electrification um, model, not the Elon Musk model for how to do it. So the, the, it's, a false, it's a false fight between nationalization and decentralization. And well, no, actually that's not quite true. There are two, there are multiple anti-monopoly histories in the US. There's a more socialist one and a more Brandeisian one. And so there is still a fight within, within that, but there's a sh agreement on the illegitimacy of concentrated private power. The question is, wh what do you nationalize and what do you decentralize? And that's, that's, I think the right debate as opposed to do we need to deal with illegitimate private power? Luke Mayville is the co-founder of a statewide organization in Idaho that recently got Medicaid expansion passed. And he wants to know if you have any ideas for promoting the anti-monopoly agenda in deep red states. Yeah. Um, it's popular. <laughs> <laughs> really popular. Yeah. Um, so the, the challenge is the politicians, not the people. Yeah, I noticed that the Trump supporters see Google, Facebook, and um, Twitter as using their monopoly power to preference Biden, which um, which it, makes it, them which makes them hostile to that monopoly power and wanting to see them at least be subject to common carrier laws, where they have to treat all customers the same. Um, the, the, actually, we did see in the polling that Republicans like big tech even less. They want to break up big tech less. There's a real dishonesty with Republican leadership, though, is, uh, first of all, there isn't evidence of that uh, uh, right-wing preference. If you look at who the most shared people are, the business model of Google and Facebook actually tends towards um, conspiracy theories. Uh, and like, if you look at top YouTube, it's incredibly dangerous. Um, and we can talk about the, that business model, which I think separately needs to be uh, addressed. But, um, but the dishonesty is that they, they, they rail about concentrated power, but they're not, they're not uh, leaders are not supporting breaking up. And so it's, it's, there's a, they don't have a meaningful solution to dealing with something they're railing uh, against all the time. So they're sort of using it for red, red meat, but not following through. It's deeply 
popular, however. And I think you're what you're going to, um, I mean, I, I don't think it's a surprise that like there's interesting alliances here, Bernie, Warren, and Amy Klobuchar. And then sometimes Cory Booker, um, he can be good on this. Sometimes he's not, he, can be, he, he, he really understands the issue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that Klobuchar has, um, has been, um, has actually drafted some of the best legislation in the Senate on this and uh, is very good on antitrust and ag. People hate John Deere, <laughs> hate <laughs> Monsanto now owned by Bayer. Um, and so th I think there's enormous opportunities and I'm very excited about J.D. Shulton's Iowa uh, race for Congress. He's running as a clear anti-monopolist. Um, my first chapter is starts with chicken farmers um, and then connects to um, Uber drivers because I think that that's an alliance we need to, a connection we need to make is sort of showing how we tend to see the world through rural and urban lenses, but that there is a, there's these sort of shared human experiences that are very, um, very similar. So it's a Republican leadership problem, not a Republican um, mem uh, uh, <laughs> a Republican constituency problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, Amy Halpern Laugh says that vertical integration in our food system is ubiquitous. Do antitrust laws address it? Um, they should. <laughs> so they, uh, the, I, again, I start with ag because it's just so obvious that it's so disgusting. And I don't even touch this, this really get past the surface of it. This is a, a, a trade book for popular reading. So this is, it's supposed to be the kind of book you can swallow up in three days, not, um, not, uh, not pickety. <laughs> so, but um, in ag, um, it's, uh, you, you are seeing a few little enforcement actions, price fixing against if in, in a few different areas, but that's just not even scratching the surface. And the, 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 the problem with our current model is we've allowed such massive vertical integration as well as tying contracts, contracts which sort of allow companies to dictate that you have to use more than one service if you're going to use one of their services. <coughs> um, <coughs> but we've allowed both of these at such a huge level that unless we address this in a structural way, it's why structural separations are so important, it's hard to spend the next 20 years just chasing after each individual instance of wrongdoing, even if we had an aggressive enforcement agency. Um, so to, um, I think it was Amy's question, ties in with the last question, which is I, I really hope that what we see is a moment where people in urban areas are really connecting, hopefully, we'll see what happens in California, to the, to the Uber fight and people in rural areas are really mad about what's happening in ag. And if we can like, just be clear that these are the same fight, <laughs> then it is a huge political opportunity. Um, and on ag, it also brings together different constituencies that are not normal, uh, normal bedfellows. So um, it's bad for food, it's bad for workers, it's bad for freedom. Um, uh, and um, I mean, if Biden really takes this moment and says, I want a rejuvenated economy and dares to say, like, let's treat this like a FDR second term moment, except with a, uh, a, a real focus on racial equity. <laughs> he dares to say that extraordinary things could happen because I think people are hungry for that kind of leadership. Uh, did Polly ever give you a, a copy of um, The Ethics of Democracy by Lewis F. Post? It's massively about trust because oh. he, he was 10 or 20 years after, he was at his peak about 10 or 20 years after Henry George was at his, and the, and the Rage for Trust, which is one of the chapters in his book, it's online on my, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll send it to you later. It's on uh, savingcommunities.org. But, well, I have a um, question for the Georgists here, as long as I've got three Georgists in a room. <laughs> <laughs> More than that. Maybe. More than that, yes. <laughs> so I'll tell you something I've been thinking about. I may even write about is I've been thinking about um, uh, and um, uh, inspired by um, 
uh, Kate Marion, who I don't know if you've ever run into her, who works in small business in uh, DC, but just really thinking about um, land and <laughs> real estate and, and looking at <clears throat> what is happening with ownership of real estate. Like going back to the, the land roots, um, ownership of real estate in places like New York City. Um, well, I, Tim Wu and, had a and, wonderful article just in the New York Times about why uh, why there are so many vacant stores. And, the, and the, the basic reason is that you've got a lot of very large wealthy owners of the real estate in New York City and they're just waiting it out. Yeah, uh, they, they are under no great pressure uh, to rent, especially now under these circumstances. But even before the pandemic, you know, they'll, they're not, they're wealthy. They don't need the bother. They'll wait for the best tenant to come along, and meanwhile, they'll hold it vacant. And uh, and you know, and there are a lot of laws, as Tim points out, that that make it easier for them to do that. But at the same time, uh, and Scott Springer has sort of tied, you know you know, talk about the idea of, of taxing land or, or certainly heavy taxes on vacant lots, uh, which again would make it less profitable to do what these guys are doing, less profitable to yeah. hold uh, stores vacant or to hold land vacant. And then I don't hear too much about it, but there's 421A, which is this regulation which has allowed, which I think it gives a 30 year tax break yeah. on improvements to yeah. new construction, which by itself it, it, it is, a, is a gift to, to big developers. But if you have that same pattern across the city in which, the, and made it up by higher taxes on the land, then you'd have what happened back in the 1920s and 30s in New York City, where you had uh, de facto 421A for the whole city. And that was when you had an enormous uh, development in the city of, of new housing all over the city because they kept the land part up, but there were deferred taxes on the buildings. And, you know, something like that would get us more of the low income housing, more of the infilling um, more of the renovation of rundown buildings and, you know, plenty of housing for everybody. You don't have to push anybody, everybody out if you're fixing stuff up. So anyway, so this is, you know, this is a Georgia's take on, yes. on the vacancies and vacant lots in New York City. There's some, there's some even more pointed monopoly aspects. And yes. in, in Pittsburgh, uh, our largest food chain got a subsidized, you know, your urban redevelopment subsidy to, and they located in a new shopping center that was subsidized. And there was nearby a competing supermarket that was leasing and they bought the, they bought the land from the landlord and refused to renew the landlord's lease and then let that sit vacant for a while. And there's a, in the, in the movie Walmart, the high cost of low prices, there was a California Walmart that got a 10 year abatement on the local sales tax. Cause after California killed property taxes, they have even local sales taxes. And so they got a 10 year abatement on the local sales tax. And when the abatement was up, they moved a mile and a half away to the next municipality which gave them a new abatement. Yeah. But they also refused to sell the land that their, old, that their old Walmart was on because if they sold it, it would be to a competitor of Walmart because that's the nature of that property is, is that it's only good for a target or somebody who would compete with Walmart. So, so yeah, they found it because the property taxes are so low in California compared to their other taxes. They found it profitable to shut down the property and keep it vacant rather than than make it available to a competitor. Yeah. So what I'm thinking about writing about in that area is, I mean, all this is so fascinating, is about private equity, which obviously it's a big uh -huh. and, and big data and the way in which, um, you know, we tend to think of big tech as tech, but everything's big tech now. And uh, the way in which um, access to that data allows for um, even greater concentration of power as uh, 
uh, an abuse of that as compared to small, smaller landlords. Um, so um, Mark, I know we have a bunch more questions here and we have like is. eight more minutes. Is that right? <laughs> so. no, we'll, we'll have to go over a little bit. We should try to keep the answers shorter. And I have, right. I have a question too I haven't asked. Um, oh, great. To for, I can't, for some reason, because I'm a host, I can't type on the Q&A. Um, to further the cause of affordable health care for all, can you compare, contrast, or combine the use of antitrust measures to bring down the cost of prescription drugs, which Trump is talking about doing? I, I don't know how much of that he did. The legalization of drugs not approved by the FDA and the provision of Medicare for all. In other words, policies of progressive anti-monopoly, libertarian free market, and democratic socialism can we, I guess he's asking, can we pick and choose the best of all four? Yeah, so uh, I, I think that's, a, it, it's a great question. I started to address it earlier. I think when you're talking about, and I, I, I was hoping to address it roughly in the previous conversation about both, about um, when it comes to pharma, pharma relies on monopoly by definition, patent is a monopoly. And so uh, significant patent reform is absolutely necessary. And <laughs> greater breakups when you have three companies controlling the insulin market, people are dying because of it. <laughs> There's a lot of evidence that in pharma, um, it's actually interesting for other areas as well. When you have three competitors, it isn't enough to actually significantly bring down the price. They come down a little bit. <laughs> But there's enough winking and nodding going on that you really need a lot more. And that's true whether they're generics or not. Having a public competition is important. I, I, I think that, you know, uh, absolutely pricing limits are important. So I guess I, I, I think a little bit of all of the above. And it's, I, 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 uh, we could talk about particular areas. Healthcare market is many different things. And so there isn't a single answer. And um, I'm probably a little more non-dogmatic than others on any single answer, but I am dogmatic about one thing. <laughs> one thing is that what we have now, <laughs> which is um, a highly concentrated um, hospitals, pharma, and medical devices is absolutely destroying people in, contra <laughs> in contravention of every religious tradition's understanding of our obligations around health, every human humanist secular understanding. It is um, cruel, unacceptable, and so I. Uh, when it comes to healthcare, I'd say bring the best of all of them. Oh, we got a new. We got Deborah's coming on, joining us. <laughs> um, Jeffrey Poten wants. Do you have a link or, or anything to the report critical of the FTC? Um, it's the. Uh, okay, sorry. It's I'm going to have to leave because I okay. have a meeting soon. Hi, Deborah. No, I can't your voice anywhere. What's up? And I'll answer your question. Um, no, I have a, a political club meeting where we're supposed to actually talk about um, Schumer, actually. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, well. So um, I don't know how I, you know, unless a few people get sick, I don't know how we're stopping her in committee. So. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, so I, I just as a side zephyr, I grew up on a chicken farm. I want you to know that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I did not know that. That is fascinating. Yes. Wow. Yes, and they did not have monopolization then. We yeah, were a no. small chicken farmer though. So and we didn't we raised eggs, not chickens. We raised the chickens for eggs, which yeah. is a different kind of thing. But I'm sure there's monopoly now in eggs, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. There weren't, they, you know, that was a long time ago. It didn't exist. We were left to flounder on our own. <laughs> anyway, I don't know how I appeared. I, I apologize because I'm going to have to disappear in like- Oh, okay, I thought you were appearing for a special appearance. No, <laughs> somebody <laughs> just allowed me to show up. I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't touch a thing. <laughs> so I do want to call out one more thing that Deborah asked in the, in the chat. Um, which is how much is personnel policy in the FTC? Because I, I, I hope that all of you, I'm, I, I, I'm not overconfident because we all have to work very hard. I'm confident that Biden is going to win. I'm going to knock all the kind of wood you can. But um, personnel is, is the policy in the FTC. 
and especially for somebody or for a Biden Harris administration and Rohit Chopra, who has been an extraordinary commissioner of the FTC, writing Brandeisian dissents for in the about the FTC's inaction would be an extraordinary chairperson of the FTC. So that is my personnel is policy. And uh, Lena Khan should run the DOJ and if not the antitrust subdivision of the DOJ. So those are two personnel pitches from me of people who would who could transform the country and radically in, in reduce inequality from their purchase within a Biden administration. This personnel is very much policy. So have fun at the club. Okay, so you were gonna tell us about the, where, where we would find the report yes. critical yes. of the FTC. Yeah, so it's it's in the 400 page report that we keep talking about the uh, antitrust sub uh, subcommittees here. I'll find a link for it if that helps. If you could paste it into the chat, then people could. Uh... Yeah, yeah. And. Um... Let's see, was it just October 6th? It feels like it's been ages ago. So. <laughs> Time is moving very strangely during this. How do I put, okay, into the chat. I think this is at least a press release to it. It's on, on the judiciary <coughs> homepage. Yeah, I already, I sent out the link to this when okay. I when I suggested people watch you testify. Okay. okay. Um, so let's um, see what, um, Karl Marx, do you want me to read this one? Karl Marx believed that land monopoly is the mother of all monopoly. Karl Marx believed that? I'm reading James Fredrickson's question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you agree with that assertion? Um, I heard I Winston, Church Winston Churchill said that point blank. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't know. It's um, a property, certain forms of property are essential. And what we're seeing now is the way in which IP, intellectual property, has become another essential, um, like, toehold into other forms of monopoly. And so I think my resistance to that is that when you look at modern forms, um, uh, like, again, I don't want to use it all the time, but uh, Amazon or Tyson, they actually aren't based in land monopoly in the same way. Now I might, you might, if you say mother, you might be talking in a different sense as if I sort of trace back the capital. Would the capital have initially had a capital seed in some other form land? Maybe, but I, but I'm resistant to the idea that, that, um, that land, I think land is absolutely essential. It, we didn't even get into the full George's discussion of the ways in which, a ways in which it sort of allows for ownership, which then leverages other ownership, and it still does so more efficiently than many other models. And I say efficiently, pejoratively, in that sense. But I, but I, but I resist the idea that of the allness of that. Um, let me let me point out that that what the the classical economists, including Adam Smith, not just George, yeah. this is all classical econ, meant by land was they meant, first of all, all natural resources, not just, you know, the surface of the earth and, you know, communally created resources too. So now when you look at a patent, what is a patent? The patent is a government created and protected right to sell a certain chemical or manufacture in a certain territory. You know, they're US patents, they're European patents and they, they make a treaty so that their patents extend to other countries but it is, still, it is still linked to territory and it is still protected by the government of that territory. So once you see you know, land more broadly, which is the way the classical account, economists saw it, you know, modern economists trivialized George and all that as if it only referred to agricultural land. And that's, that's an intentional way of oh. resisting a very powerful idea. Yeah. And uh, the other, the yeah, the I always tell people the four big monopolies are land monopoly. Um, you mentioned intellectual property monopolies. Um, the 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 um, the monopoly of new money issuance because money is loaned into circulation. So people who have the best credit have a monopoly advantage over people who have to um, borrow at higher rates. And the the um, 
The fourth one was um, right of way monopolies that, you know, that some things like cable TV or, or something, there's going to be very few cable TV providers because you're not going to string, you know, dozens of different companies cables up on, on your telephone poles. So cable TV, telephone, water, sewer. Now water and sewer are usually government, but not always. Uh, but those, those a, anything that's a a a, um, a natural monopoly. So. Yeah, it's a natural, but it's a right of way monopoly. And network monopolies have a lot of the similar characteristics. So um, government didn't give Facebook a monopoly, but the people who logged onto Facebook, you know, you can have a much better system than Facebook. But the reason I'm on Facebook is because everybody else is on Facebook. So, so the network monopoly is a new variant of that right of way monopoly. Um, yeah, it's such, a, it's such a powerful point at, at a, at, it's, a, it's sort of a helpful framing, but also a really important point because I think another purpose of this book and of this moment is it's not true that all problems have always existed in the same way. That isn't true, <laughs> of course. However, um, there's far more similarities to the current problems of economic tyranny and abuse than there are differences. And um, there's a lot of hope in history. And the fact that these, there are a series of tools and strategies that have been repeatedly used at moments of concentration um, and corporate tyranny in the past it's very helpful. I think people often get terrified of tech. And once the, when, if you think about it as radically novel, it feels like you can't do anything about it. It's natural. Um, and as somebody says uh, here is that like, you know, saying governments of course must regulate uh, markets and corporations to preserve individual freedoms. We have to understand that the markets are a series of choices about law, not organic things that are trampling us and digital markets are no different. They are not like, in, they do not inevitably lead to gig work. That's, that's a series of choices about labor law. That isn't a side effect of tech. <laughs> so it's a series of choices about corporate law and liability law and agency law. That's not tech <laughs> that has led to the gig economy. Um, and uh, if, we, if we address it as a, new, a totally new problem, we're rejecting uh, all kinds of rusty tools that can be cleaned off. Yeah, I, 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 so I really uh, appreciate your frame, framing there. I had one, I, I, I'll bring my question now because it ties directly to what you just said. Um, pri it, there is an old, an old thing that goes back to um, Rockefeller getting the railroads to give him a kickback on his competitors um, th uh, you know, Rockefeller forced the railroads to charge his competitors more to haul their oil than they were charging to haul his. Yeah. And, um, and that led to restraint of trade laws. And as I understand it, the restraint of trade laws as they apply to conventional retailers is that Walmart, if I'm, if I'm um, manufacturing bicycles, Walmart mm -hmm. can, can legally say to me, you, you have to give us as good a price as you give anybody else, but they cannot legally say you have to charge other people more than you're charging us. Mm -hmm. and, but Amazon has a loophole for that because they are not a conventional retailer. Yeah. Amazon says you cannot sell this on eBay or your own website or anywhere else cheaper than you're selling it here, but Amazon charges a 15% markup. So if I want to sell it for $100 on Amazon, I have to, they're going to charge 115. And then I'm not legally allowed to sell it for less than 115 on my own website. Yeah. And that's the spirit of that and uh, the restraint of trade law is being violated there. Yeah. So this is both shows the, the strength and the weakness of our laws is currently written. Um, they are a short, as uh, the one of the amendments to the Constitution, <laughs> it, it's you know I, I should count the words, but it's a couple hundred words. Uh, restraint of trade is not clearly defined, and the the advantage of that, one of the effects of that, is that courts have all the power. 
so courts and enforcers have like so much power in uh, filling in the scope of that. The dream is that that allows for changing times so that as you have changing circumstances, the spirit of the laws can be applied to changing times. The tragedy of modern antitrust has been that um, the, what has filled in the um, vagueness by language like monopoly, undefined, restraint of trade, <laughs> is um, modern neoliberal economics. And so uh, instead of it being flexible to deal with the changing strategies for abuse, it has been flexible to encompass the narrow abstract and corporate serving uh, the theories of the modern economics academy. And some, <laughs> some people think then, therefore, we should, um, uh, you know, change the content of who the judiciary is, which I happen to agree with, <laughs> uh, change, you know, uh, have a new administration that's clear about a different spirit of the laws. I also, and, and this is an area of just, just to be clear, of genuine debate, think that a little more um, definition in the antitrust laws would be a little helpful because, because the flexibility, unfortunately, given the power of the economics bar right now, um, the, the, the flexibility has served as flexibility for power, not flexibility for uh, the integrity of the enforcement of these laws. And um, so I don't think we should treat these as, as saintly. Uh, and they're not constitutional. It's up to Congress to, to change the law when it's not working. And the example you gave is a great example of something where I can easily imagine a state law judge in uh, many different generations in our country saying, yeah, that's a problem. But modern economic theory has filled in the content of restraint of trade in a different way. Um, Victor Ramirez. So, I, oh, are you, is there another question there? Oh, there's, oh. there's several, so go ahead. And I, I actually am probably gonna have well, to go for about six minutes, so. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, let, I me just... get, let me get okay. Victor's quickly. He, he learned today that hospitals have monopolies similar to taxi medallions called certificates of need. Do you cover these in your book and how big of a problem are they? You know, um, I uh, do not go that deeply into hospitals in my book. Um, and I would advise reading Phil Longman, who's really, um, is a really probably, I think the best writer on um, what's happening in the hospital industry. Um, and so it's not an area of my deep knowledge. What I do know about hospitals, however, and um, Again, I mentioned this earlier, and I, I think I mentioned it in passing in the book, although I focus more on, um, on uh, Medicare for all and decentralized um, uh, suppliers, um, is that hospital mergers, and there's really strong evidence on this, that hospital mergers have been a major, major driver of increased costs and, and decreased yep. care. And, um, and that uh, for-profit, nonprofit is not an answer um, that it's all also very bad for workers. Um, so that, and that it's uh, led to um, huge swaths of our country being governed in the health industry with these extractive um, and very dangerous hospital monopolies. And so uh, this is an area where even having three hospitals in area actually really significantly reduces costs and many areas have um, uh, no choice, basically no choice. But I, but I do not go to certificates of need and it's not a... Yeah. It a My understanding of them is basically that it's, that's a, it's an example of where regulation protects monopoly. What, and they have similar, I used to move furniture for a living and they had the same thing in furniture moving, which was when you apply for a license with the Public Utility Commission to move furniture, all the existing furniture companies can file against you and you have to demonstrate that, the, that there's not a glut of furniture moving companies and that you're serving a, a need. But you can buy somebody else's license. So their license, when they go out of business, is sellable like a taxi medallion. Got it, yeah. That's, That's interesting, um, yeah. See if there's any other questions or anybody we haven't had. Um, uh, I, there's some great questions in here. I don't think we're going to um, get to all of them. Jeffrey Potent asked some great questions. Um, you know, charging market. Jane Fredrickson uh, we, we is that. about the 
if we charged market rents for the electric magnetic space uh, sta uh, electromagnetic spectrum yes um that would intensify competition with tv and radio and cell phone and uh because nobody could nobody could run a low energy tv program or something they would have to they would have to compete more vigorously i i, I would like to answer the question about what can people do besides vote before closing out <laughs> <laughs> so that will be my last answer but polly did you want to well i just i wanted to mention that actually there's a, a short piece in the latest new york review of books by linda greenhouse who's saying that a one of the most important tasks in front of us is to rebuild trust in government. Yeah. You know, get you know, Reagan said the 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 that government is the enemy, and yeah. and what we've seen reinforces that. And it is so important that you know, yes, you know, regulatory agencies get too cozy with uh, the people they're regulating, but that's why you have to watch them. Yeah, and you can still in many cases they really are on the side of the public if the public is paying attention and thanking them yeah um uh well the, i guess the, the very much related to what paula just said and to the question about what you can do besides vote is that one of the big opportunities here is actually in the states now i don't know how many new yorkers there are here but i, I know there's at least some uh, and New York, it's not just the federal government. New York has some very exciting actual anti-monopoly legislation. So at the city level, you saw legislation limiting what um, fees uh, delivery platforms can charge restaurants. You might not naturally think about that as an anti-monopoly law, but after you read my book, you will. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> and um, at the state level, um, you have Ron Kim, who's really focused. He's the only lawmaker I know who has anti-monopolist in his Twitter bio, which among is not the only reason, but I think he's a wonderful lawmaker in many ways. Um, and then Mike Generis and uh, Senator Thompson are proposing new antitrust legislation. States can enforce antitrust legislation. States can have limits on how abusive Amazon can be within <laughs> New York. States can pass stronger uh, anti-predatory pricing legislation. And really critically, if there's a private right of action, which is a different way of saying power isn't, it's not just in the AG's office. And by the way, I think Tish James doing Whoops, you froze. Uh, but they have, they, have a, uh, they have an amazing antitrust division, amazing antitrust division. That amazing well, antitrust division cannot do all the work without a private right of action being, you know, that other, so it's just that they, they can't take on all the work that is to be done. So there's a new bill out there supporting this bill at the city level, supporting the bill at the state level, being part of the local anti-monopoly movement helps show that government is not just sort of supplicant <laughs> begging for Amazon to come to New York, but instead will fight for a vibrant small business and pro-worker economy. And um, so there's a lot of opportunity at the federal level, but locally pay attention to those fights. Then I'm going to mention a few groups that I would follow if you follow on social media. Um, um, uh, Open Markets Institute, American Economic Liberties Project, Institute for Local Self-Reliance, <laughs> Athena, which is the group that is bringing together labor and small businesses against Amazon. Acre, which really focuses on the way that monopolies and corporate concentration hurts communities of color. These are four or five groups that are all doing incredible work in this area. Demos, um, uh, which you may know, uh, is less of a grassroots group, but uh, really does incredible work in this area. And Sabil Rahman is a great anti-monopolist who's leading Demos. So that's six. Um, and, and sort of as you follow those, we used to have thousands of anti-monopoly leagues in this country. My dream is that we have them again. But as you follow those, those may create the seeds for you forming your local anti-monopoly club. So you're part of the Sierra Club and your anti-monopoly club. And you're ready to go protest the FTC. Because I promise you, if you're on this call, you haven't done a sit-in at the FTC because nobody has for a long time. So, so time for more of that. <laughs>
Could you send those links out or send them to me? I can send them to you. Yeah, I'll send them to you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And anybody who wants that link she already put on the chat, uh, copy it and paste it into your own uh, computer because um, because when we log off, you'll lose that chat page. We'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, Zephyr. Um, thank you, yes. Yeah. And things like, um, I'd like to tell people who are listening in and that if you enjoyed these programs that the CGO offers free of charge, please consider supporting our work with a donation today. Um, as a small nonprofit, the CGO strives to consistently create quality program that brings our community together and educates those outside of it. But this content isn't free to produce. Um, so we'd appreciate a donation if you can. You can contribute. Um, on our website, which is www.cgocouncil.org, or by mailing a check uh, to the Council of Georgia's Organizations at 4075 Cheltenham uh, Court in Plainfield, Indiana, 46168. Um, again, uh, we really appreciate it. We appreciate Polly getting Zephyr. Zephyr, we'll hope you'll come back. Heck, and uh, if you're available, maybe we can do something for you this summer. Uh, when we have a, we may have a conference or at least a hybrid in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Not that. Oh good. yeah, yeah. Like, not that I mean, once we have the vaccine, we'll do a we'll do a, a, a Prairie Georgist. Okay. Trip. All we'll right. Tour. All right. Thank we'll you. Do. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much, all Thank of you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>